Amen. Amen. Well, now is the moment we've all been waiting for. Our keynote speaker. Amen. 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 And I'm sure she has a word, a right now word, for such a time as this. Kini Lusby is a native of Chicago, Illinois. Growing up, both of her parents were preachers involved in their church and other local ministries, which set a powerful example for her. She began her professional career working on local, state, and national political campaigns. She has held the position of Chief of Staff in the office of the Illinois State Representative, Eddie Winter, and was on the staff of Illinois State Senator Patricia Van Pelt. Kiwi earned her Bachelor's of Science degree from Western Illinois University and her Master's of Science from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She answered the call of God on her life at the age of 22 and has been serving God ever since. Her compassion and passion for ministry grew during these years as she faithfully served in many capacities. She has traveled the world showing others what God can do with a willing heart and a simple yes. Kibi has a passion for youth and social justice issues. She serves as a board member for several philanthropic or philanthropic organizations in Chicago and Springfield, Illinois. She has been mentoring you for over 20 years. Amen. I first met Kibi at a McDonald's restaurant. It was at a, I believe they called it a lunch and learn session with the police. And those of you that know Pastor Donald Mays' testimony, that was a testimony for me to be in McDonald's talking to the police on the other side. And when I met Kiwi, we clicked right away. Not to mention we're both from Chicago, but we have a passion for people. Amen. Stand with me as we welcome the Honorable she said, I'm to get me, but I'll future. <laughs> I'll let you fill in the blank. <laughs> let's welcome the mighty woman of God, Kiwi Love. Come on, let's welcome her. Yeah! Thank you so much for having me to the Ministerial Alliance and the President 
um, Pastor Donald Mays, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I don't take it lightly. To my pastor and my mentor, Dr. Denise, um, for continuing to push me beyond my limits. As much as I fight you, thank you. Um, to the clergy in the building, thank you so much. I honor you. To the contestants, you guys did an amazing job. To my mentee, Harris, I'm going to see you after. That's $700. So yeah. <laughs> and the rest of the $700, we can meet after. <laughs> we can discuss some things. Um, I don't take it lightly, and I recognize that I stand on the shoulders of my community, my, my family, my friends. So to, to my parents, my dad, um, I'm not really sure what they do in heaven, but I am absolutely positive that he's doing something extra right now. Mm. <laughs> to my mother, the future Dr. Lesby, um, thank you for your sacrifices, Ma. Um, I tell you often that if I can be a fourth of the wife, the mother, the sister, the daughter that you are, then I will be okay. So I love you. Thank you so much. Um, to my brother. To my brothers who are my riders. Um, my friends, my family. I call them my superheroes. And many of you don't know, but they literally have traveled the highways and the byways to be here to support me. So. I honor you and I, I really appreciate it. Um, to my mentors who are here, some are here, some are not, but thank you so much for taking your time to invest in me, uh, mentally, physically, sometimes financially. I really appreciate all that you do. And last but certainly not least, um, to my sisters, to the women of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, I love you guys. Thank you for supporting me. Amen. It's funny, Dr. Mays, uh, I keep calling him Dr. Mays, something about that. Mm. Uh, Pastor Mays just tapped right into it for such a time as this. Um, as we are here to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King and all his accomplishments and all the things that he has uh, done in his remarkable leadership, there is something to be said about those who supported him, those who invested in him, those who mentored him. A community of people shaped Dr. King. They supported him, they encouraged him, they inspired him. He stood on the shoulders of his community. And one of the things I love most about Dr. King, besides his ability to serve and his ability to stand in the face of adversity was his ability to mentor. Um, Dr. King was an advocate for mentorship and most people don't know that you know when you hear the story of Dr. King it's not very often that you hear of his mentors and those people who supported him um, but the reality is even in this this time where we're so accustomed to hearing um, people talk about how they made it on their own the reality is we don't make it on our own amen okay? amen success is never achieved alone and sometimes, you know, we need a encouragement on our journeys. And sometimes it don't necessarily uh, come from people that we expect it to come from. Um, even as I was preparing for this message, uh, I was reminded of one of my favorite books in the Bible, Esther. And so often we hear the story of Esther with little to no emphasis put on Mordecai, the person who mentored her into her position, the person who made sure that she was developed before she went on to become Queen Esther. Um, I know I have quite a bit of theologians in the building, so I'm just going to ask you guys to just follow me for a second. I'm just, <laughs> just give me a couple minutes. I'm going to work here. Esther 4 and 14 says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come to a kingdom for such a time as this. I know, you know, we have some people who may not necessarily know who Esther was. So Esther was 14 years old when Mordecai took her in. He 
adopted her as his own. He um, took her in after both of her parents died. Esther was also recruited to be queen after Queen Vashti was kicked out of the kingdom um, for rebelling against the king. So during this time, she becomes queen and Mordecai advises her not to reveal her Jewish background. Now the plot thickens. Haman, a prime minister, um, had an issue with Mordecai who refuses to bow to him to honor him. So Mordecai decides that, you know, I understand that custom tells us to bow to you, but Mordecai being a Jew says that I only bow to the God of Israel. Sometimes, when you choose not to follow the masses, when you choose to be different, when you choose to walk your own path, the haters are coming. Amen. They may not come immediately, but they are coming. You can be on the lookout. When you choose to be different, the haters will come. Yes. And Haman, not just necessarily being content with killing Mordecai, comes up with this plot. And it's not just a plot to kill Mordecai, but it's to kill off his bloodline. So anything that is associated to him, he wants it gone. Yeah. Right. And being a Jew, he wants to take out the nation of the Jewish people simply because he refused to bow. He tells the king the story of if you choose to this if you choose to accept this honor from this one man, everybody else will fall in line. So we need to take care of this right now. The king agrees and decides that hey, you can, you can have what you wish. Mordecai sends words back to Esther and tells of this plot and asks the queen to go to the king to plead for their lives. Because remember, Esther is still a Jew. Now the problem comes where Esther has not been called into the king. And there's only one situation uh, that the king allows those to come see him is he called for you. So you don't come unless you've been sent for one. Come on, come on, Esther tells him, okay, so you want me to go into the king. I haven't been called to the king, but this is what you want me to do. Mordecai reminds her that, as I read earlier, Esther 4 and 14, don't think because you're in the king's house, you alone of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise from another place. But who knows? But that you've come to this royal position for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Esther simply sends a message back and says, this is what I need you to do. Yeah, yeah. If I'm going to risk my life, I'm going to need you to get all the Jews together, not just you and your buddies. I need everybody to come into this place and fast for three days. And her and her servants will also fast for three days. Now, <laughs> Mordecai is praying for her during this transitional period. Because, I mean, unless the king extends the scepter, she dies. His counsel is what helps Esther put his fears aside to go to see the king. So I tell you that sometimes opportunities will present itself where we can't remain silent, where we have been strategically put into position to stand up, speak up, and refuse to back. For such a time as this. It's been said that a mentor is someone who sees more talent and ability within you than you see within yourself. Amen. You help bring it out. Amen. Um, this person is a trusted counselor or a guide. By mentoring Esther, Mordecai essentially impacts an entire nation. Yeah. I'm sure that when Mordecai took her in at the age of 14 that he didn't think she would be queen. Yeah. All right. 
So if a mentor's job is to encourage and inspire and to, max, to help these individuals maximize their potential, that's exactly what Mordecai did. And I know you guys are looking at me funny, like why is she talking so much about mentorship? Because I'm passionate about it. My life has been tremendously impacted by mentors. Yes, I had amazing parents, but the reality is I was also surrounded by mentors who was nothing short but heaven sent. One of my mentors actually says, and he says it often, do something good for someone every day, and when you become successful, give back. We have an obligation to reach back. It's literally a biblical mandate to reach back. And if we don't, literally as the, as the contestants were talking, we will be in the same position that we're in in 2068. We're greatly impacted by those who speak into our lives, those who push us beyond our limits. And even as we, we begin to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's accomplishment, please remember that he had mentors who sustained him, who supported him, encouraged and guided him. Dr. King often referred to Dr. Benjamin Mays as his spiritual mentor and intellectual father. Dr. Mays was an outspoken critic of segregation long before the modern um, civil rights movement existed. He was a friend of Dr. King Sr. and he was also the president of Morehouse College. Well, many of us know that Dr. King was enrolled in Morehouse at the age of 15, which is where he met Dr. Mays. Happenstance, uh, Dr. Mays is also a remarkable speaker and Southern Baptist minister. And Dr. King often says that, you know, he credits Dr. Mays as his influence to be an administrator. Dr. Mordecai Johnson. There goes those Mordecais again. There's something about them and mentorship. Dr. Johnson was considered one of the most prominent religious leaders, and he often spoke of his love for Gandhi. He was the 13th president of Howard University, um, and during this time, Dr. King attended one of his lectures um, on a teaching for Gandhi. And actually, after this teaching, um, after this lecture, Dr. King goes and buys six books of Gandhi. He had a profound influence on his commitment to nonviolence resistance. And one of my favorite, um, particularly because he's labeled the outsider, Bayer Rustin. He was a civil rights leader. He traveled the country teaching others about love, respect, and the power of nonviolence. He recognized Dr. King's leadership abilities and helped him organize the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, Rustin was also instrumental in strategizing um, the Civil Rights Movement from 1955 to 1968. He was also the chief organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. So I mentioned these amazing men, but please remember that there were also women who mentored Dr. King. We talk about his mother, who is Alberta Williams King, and she influenced him and shaped his, not just his, his foundation, but she established that before anybody else was able to reach Dr. King. Amen. His wife, Coretta Scott King, um, has been uh, credited as the glue that held the civil rights movement together. And even after her husband's assassination, she worked tirelessly to make sure his dreams came into fruition. She became active in the women's movement. She founded the Dr. King Center, and she also made sure that her husband's birthday was recognized as a national holiday. She traveled the world fighting injustice. And then, I can never leave out Ella Baker. She was a human rights activist, a grassroots organizer, 
And for those in politics, we know we love grassroots organizers because they get things done. <laughs> She has been called one of the most important black leaders of the 20th century and perhaps the most influential woman in the civil rights movement. She worked tirelessly behind the scene organizing and working with civil rights leaders. She was the first hire of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as an executive director. But during this time, she also helped establish the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But she was an advocate for mentoring the next generation. Some of you may say, these are people you expect to mentor because of their pedigree. Did you, did you not hear their bios? I heard them. But as I said earlier, sometimes mentorship comes from those you least expect. Amen. We often talk about Dr. King's um, I Have a Dream speech and not even realize that without Mahalia Jackson, this speech may have never been heard. Oh, wow. Mahalia Jackson, a musical legend. According to one of Dr. King's advisor, Clarence Jones, he said, during a pivotal moment in a 1963 march on Washington, Dr. King began to struggle with his speech. Jones said, Mahalia Jackson simply yelled from the back, tell him about the dream. Tell him about the dream, Martin. <laughs> Jones said it was almost as a mandate for him to respond that Dr. King's body language simply went from a lecturer to a preacher and only as a true Southern Christian, I mean a Southern Baptist preacher could, he simply turned a five, what was supposed to be, five minutes into 16 iconic minutes in American history. mentioned one of the things that I most admired about Dr. King was his commitment to mentorship. Not only did he have mentors, but he made sure that he reached back and got somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, the people that we're so familiar about hearing is Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis was inspired by Dr. King's work. And it was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the one that Ella Baker helped set up. During a, um, the Civil Rights Movement, John Woods organized students to march across the bridge in Selma, Alabama. A moment that we know as Bloody Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Lewis was beaten so bad that his skull was fractured. But he didn't let that stop him. Because once he recovered, he continued to work for civil rights and was elected the U.S. Representative of Georgia's 5th District in 1986, a position he still holds today. Yeah. Woo. So I mentioned all these people not just for common knowledge because it's not about just knowing who these people were. But the reality is we all need mentors. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your race, your social economic status, or your educational level. If you have breath in your body, there is purpose for you. Amen. 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 So whatever season you find yourself in, someone can benefit from your guidance and your direction and your wisdom. So I, I say that no one achieves success alone, but I really mean that no one achieves success alone. Even Jesus needed John the Baptist to make the way. Amen. Joshua needed Moses. David needed Jonathan. Elizabeth needed Mary. Naomi needed Ruth. Michael Jordan needed Dean Smith. Whitney Houston needed Clyde Davis. For those hip-hop people, Drake needed Lil Wayne. And Kanye, <laughs> yes, I said Kanye, needed Jay-Z. I don't care what you say. Kanye needed Jay-Z. <laughs> so we all need somebody, right? Amen. We can't achieve success alone. And I, I seem, it, it only seems appropriate to wrap this up with some quotes for Dr. King. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Uh, 
Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and where he stands in time, but where he stands in time of challenge and controversy. So I pose this question to you guys is we're the Mordecai's of today. What are you doing to help the next generation? Will you help the next generation? We talk about change, but change can't happen unless we mentor some leaders. So I simply ask you, find somebody to mentor. Young or old, find somebody to mentor. Amen. And for those who, you know, oh, I can't mentor, find somebody. <laughs> somebody willing to listen to you. I don't know who they are, but somebody Amen. is willing to listen. So I simply ask, you know, as we celebrate Dr. King, let's remember what he stood for. Amen. Let's remember the things that he taught us. Let's remember the people who invested in him to get Dr. Martin Luther King. Because without those people that I mentioned earlier, there is no Dr. King. Amen. So I truly hope you guys can look to the left and look to the right and find someone to mentor. Thank you. Amen. 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 I couldn't, just, couldn't help it. I couldn't help it, God. Hallelujah. 